North Yorkshire, the largest county in England and Wales. From seaside resorts like Scarborough to the historic city of York. It just offers you everything that policing could offer you. You, you work the cities, you work the rural areas. 6,000 miles of some of Britain's most scenic and most unforgiving roads. Yeah, we've got three casualties out of the vehicle that's there in front of us. The traffic cops here deal with among the highest number of serious collisions per capita within the UK. Roundabout, wrong way, wrong way. Tonight, rural raiders. Countryside crashes. Not an awful lot we can do with your car, is there, really? It's terrifying, it's very, very, very scary. And a toxic chemical spill on the motorway threatens a nearby village. Had the wind got any stronger or changed direction, then we definitely would have been looking at getting people in the houses or maybe even evacuating them to somewhere else. Welcome to North Yorkshire, a vast area stretching the traffic cops to the limit. North Yorkshire's countryside attracts millions of visitors every year. But not all of them are welcome. A third of the crimes committed here are by crooks who travel from outside the county to raid its affluent rural areas. They'll take quad bikes that the farmers use to get around. We have a lot of thefts, we have a lot of fuel thefts, uh, plant equipment going. Yorkshire stone that um, is on top of the old barns is worth quite a lot of money. We, we have a lot of animals that are taken in the night as well. Recently, North Yorkshire's been hit by a much more sinister crime spree. An organised gang of thieves responsible for more than 30 violent burglaries on country estates and rural homes. You've got to appreciate that these people are prepared to use force and the, and the career, career criminals, the baddest kind of people we meet. We have lots of information about lots of bad guys coming into our area and we go out and actively target those people. It's 9am at Tadcaster Police Station. PC Mick Roth and a team of road crime officers are alerted to another theft by the gang. This time, it's a £50,000 Audi A4 stolen from a country home. The guys in this car had been to a country type property. The lady of the house had disturbed him and he'd badly beaten her with a golf club. They'd stolen shotguns, uh, they'd stolen two very expensive cars, this being one of them, and they'd stolen lots of expensive clothing and uh, champagne. The cops have already got an unmarked car tailing the suspects down the A1 motorway. Mick and his team of highly trained pursuit drivers join the A1 to intercept the thieves. You know that car is up in front, maybe a mile or so, maybe half a mile, you don't know, but it's there. There are now four police cars closing in on the suspects who are stuck in the traffic ahead. The plan now is to box the Audi, surround it and force it to a stop. It's a dangerous manoeuvre, especially against desperate criminals. These tactics are only employed in life and death situations. You know at any moment you're going to be behind a vehicle that's quite prepared to exceed 100 mile an hour. You've got to step up to the mark and you've got to do the job. It's quite quiet in the car now. You know that anything is going to happen any moment. So all you're doing is listening for the radio. You're listening for that call from the lads in front. Strike, strike, strike. Just as Mick and the team prepare to box the Audi, the suspects spot the cops and head towards the exit slip road. You know when a car makes a move across three lanes in that kind of traffic, you know he's seen you. We've now got an exit and it's really bad luck. Is that it up there? We can do it now. Tell me. Mick and the team must make their move now or risk the suspects escaping. 
My job is now to get around the front of the car and stop it from getting anywhere. As the cops box the Audi, the suspects spring the trap, forcing Mick and the team to take extreme measures. Mick rams the Audi, and once again the police surround him. If they get away from us now, then they may well put people's lives at risk. There was suggestion that firearms had been taken from one of the burglaries, and even now it stopped. Are they going to shoot the way out? You just don't know. Before the thieves have time to react, the cops have them surrounded. The chase is over. Following their arrests, uh, property from that burglary where this car was taken was found and found at the premises where they were, uh, and ultimately they were linked to that job. The men in the Audi and two others were found to be responsible for almost 40 offences, including theft of vehicles, jewellery and cash worth more than £300,000. They were sent to prison for a total of nine years and ten months. This is one of those jobs where you make a decision that is very, very high risk, but it pays off, it all works out. When the traffic cops in North Yorkshire aren't hunting down criminals raiding its rural landscape, their job is more often about dealing with bad smashes on country roads. On the northeast coast, at the traffic cops base in Scarborough, it's 3.30 p.m. Traffic constable Dan Hughes is catching up on some paperwork when a call comes in. Hello, T.T. Hughes. We've just had a report of a vehicle that's gone off the road. Um, top side of Whitby, in between the village of Danby and Fry Up. It sounds like the car's upside down in a river. In 2013, North Yorkshire recorded 1,600 collisions, 46 of which were fatal. When the report comes in that uh, there's a vehicle gone off the road and into a river, um, you do wonder what, what you're going to be faced with when you get there. You know, there had been a lot of rain at the time, so potentially you could be faced with something quite dramatic. The accident has occurred in a remote part of the North Yorkshire Moors. Over 30 miles from Scarborough on winding country roads, it could take up to an hour to reach the location. As officers work in these areas, you do build up quite a good geographical knowledge of the area, but uh, sometimes you, you're going to be attending areas that you've never been to before that are a long distance away. Trying to navigate your way there as well as concentrating on your driving and thinking about the incident you're going to be faced with, it's, it's quite a task, really. As I say, we've covered 30 miles now, um, at speeds of over 100 miles an hour at some point. Poor weather, so there's a rabbit for this one. Dan's looking for a crossing on the River Esk, but the specific location isn't easy to find. This will be the river down in the bottom of the valley, you see, so we're running sort of alongside it. So you can get to fry up that way. There. After 30 minutes on the road, Dan finally locates the accident. Screaming 4 3 X N. I think I'm going to state 6. I can see some hazard lights and yellow coats. The main priority when we turn up at an accident scene is is there anybody injured? Is there anybody we need to help? to win in an ambulance. This pickup fell 30 feet into the swollen river. Is everybody OK? Is everybody all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Miraculously, the driver is unhurt. He managed to escape by climbing out of his side window before the vehicle filled with water. You've been in a change of underpants, are you? <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Not an awful lot we can do with your car, is there, really? No, I think 4-3, this vehicle is submerged in the river. Um, it has taken out the entire stretch of metal railings on the bridge, um, and there's a fair old drop down into quite an overflowing and fast-moving river. This could have been a, a fatal collision. The driver of a second car involved managed to avoid going over the edge. Well, I came round the corner, um, and the lad there came, came round this corner, sort of seen me, and it's thing I heard was that the brakes going on, screeching. He then swerved, missed me completely, thankfully, 
uh, hit the barrier and then just went straight over into the river. Then I ran across, of course, looked in and he was uh, looking up at me from the, from inside the car. I just thought, Christ, is he going to be uh, stuck in there? I mean, if he'd knocked himself unconscious, uh, obviously we'd need to go in and get him. He, well, he just came out and he went, I'm fine. <laughs> As if it was nothing, no, nothing had happened. I've never come across anything like this in, in my career. Not just from the lucky escape point of view, but um, you know, quite such a dramatic drop into into deep water. Well, at least you're all right. You know. Yeah, that's the most important thing. You didn't have anybody with you that's been because if you had a passenger or something, they'd Nobody be bur buried underneath you, wouldn't they? Yeah. Did it fill with water quickly? Or? Oh yeah, it was. Was I was, it? I was like panicking then. Yeah. With no one hurt, the question for Dan now is: Was the driver of the pickup at fault? Obviously, part of my uh, dealing with this incident, I've got to decide whether there's there's anybody culpable for it. I'll spare you any lectures in relation to driving, really, but I'll, I will say there's only one reason it's happened, and that yeah. will be excessive speed. Yeah. And you obviously use this road on a daily basis, Re regular, and you're yeah. familiar with it, yeah. and that sometimes breeds a bit of complacency at, at what potentially could be round the bend. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't propose to take any further action for a careless driving or anything like that. No amount of penalty points or... Um, sitting in a classroom learning about the dangers of the roads and um, the consequences of a collision uh, are going to sort of give this driver any more impact than what's already happened. But there is one person who might be having sterner words with the lucky pickup driver. Do you want me to try this landline? Yeah, please, mate. Just to open mics so or just, if it answers, just Hello? speak. Hi, babe. Hello. Can you come and pick me up? My, my van's in the river. I'm in the police car, no swearing, please. <laughs> Heaven only knows what's going through her mind um, when she gets that, that comment of, I don't think she really heard him say the car was upside down in the river. She was picking up on the fact he said, I'm in a police car. You're in a police car? Yes. What for? Because my car's upside down in the river. What? Yeah. <laughs> Can you come get me? What's happened to you? I'll see you then, OK? Bye. Bye. She'll be panicking now, bless her. <laughs> It's an hour since Dan's call-out when the driver's wife arrives. Oh, you're taking your life in your hands now, showing the missus what you've done. Goodness me. She's telling me. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't have a passenger, because he does yeah. normally have a passenger. He has no dentist with him. It's very lucky. Yeah. It's just such a good job it's landed the way it has. What if it had landed on the driver's side? Well, I've been dead. As if his missus lets him come out of the house now and drive down this road. You know, he'll be doing it at five or ten miles an hour, I would suspect. North Yorkshire's 6,000 miles of country roads are most vulnerable at night. Under the cover of darkness, criminals come to raid farms and homes. Rural thefts rose by 5% across the UK in 2013 and cost more than £44 million. Unfortunately, we deal with a lot of uh, travelling criminals um, from outside the county that, that, that want to come to North Yorkshire. Catching them committing the crimes in such a massive area is sometimes very, very difficult to do. But the cops have a tool to keep tabs on would-be raiders. Strategically placed automatic number plate recognition cameras, ANPR for short, which identify vehicles used by criminals so cops can be sent to intercept them. I think AMPR is the best tool that the police has ever had. Um, it's awesome, and we can we can cover so much more mileage just by remote cameras um, than we can drive in a day or a night. At the force control room in York, a car with links to burglary has triggered ANPR cameras. And 15 miles away near Weatherby, on the southern border of the county. Traffic cop Steve Gardner is responding to the camera hit. Yeah, we just had an AMPR hit on the motorway, southbound uh, Audi A4. Just happened to be in the right place for that one, so we'll uh, get, see if we can give it a tug and see who's in it, see where they're from. We got a call from the control room um, giving us the heads up on a car that might be involved in burglaries, so um, head out to the motorway and see if we can find it. That about a mile north. Services in lane two. The vehicle we're looking for has been sighted by my colleague uh, who's in an unmarked vehicle at the moment. Uh, That's it there. 
An unmarked car is already tailing the vehicle, which has four suspects. It's quite a few, isn't it? Cruising the county at this time of the morning is raising the traffic cops' suspicions. We, we have intelligence what this car might be up to, but at this point in time, the fact that it's three or four up at four o'clock in the morning, we have no idea where it's just come from or why it's on the road. Vehicle stop. Hi there, how you doing? Is it your car, sir? It's just a look in the car. This, this chap sat in the driver's seat wearing just his boxes only. Wait, what happened to your trousers? Yeah. Pants are in the back because they're mucky. Pants are in the back because they're mucky. Yeah. All right. Where have you been tonight? Rabbiting. Later. Rabbiting? Shall I see it at Nairs, bro? Yeah. The car is full of dead rabbits. It's more to them. You know, we're not messing about. It looks like the men have been out hunting, but Steve is not convinced this is all they've been up to. Just about every single night shift I work, we come across at least one of these cars. They may take rabbits, they may uh, have ferrets on board, they might have dogs on board, but at the end of the day, they could also be casing a burglary for the following night or the night after. What's your home address, please? Garfield. Garfield. Where is it? What area? Postcode? The driver lives near Barnsley, but says he's been catching rabbits in Leyburn. That's a 160-mile round trip. They're two counties away from where they should be. Um, there's plenty of rabbits near Barnsley, I'm sure. Um, they're definitely up to no good. Well, have you had owner's permission to be on any land? Yeah. OK. How did you get there, then? Yeah. Leyburn City, down a few roads, and he met us at farm. You're talking rubbish, aren't you? I'm a talking rubbish. What else? What you don't even know how to get there. You mean, close enough, close enough to get there. Have you got his phone number? Straight down 81 now, yeah. So how did you meet him then? So I've lost my phone on his field. I've got his phone number. I've lost my phone on his field. Right. OK, follow. Rabbiting is legal with the landowner's permission, but despite their suspicions, there's no proof they've been up to no good. You see they've got the livestock in the vehicle? They've got loads of dead rabbits. Yeah, you know. Yeah. It says that's all they've got, rabbits. Right. So we can have a look to see what else. Right. They've got dogs in. Yeah, they've got dogs in the boot, yeah. In the boot? Yeah, apparently. He said, if you open, the do open that boot, the dogs are going to be all over the motorway. Although there's no evidence they've been hunting illegally, it doesn't mean they're free to go. You got a bald tie, fella? Yeah, sure have. In fact, you got two of them. Sometimes when we think that we're going to be dealing with a crime, um, we come across traffic offences. Right, there's no tags. Right. The tire looks very bold. 0.2 of a millimetre. This car is driving on the road illegally. It's got two ball tyres, it doesn't have any tax. Um, this driver's going to accrue points on his licence. Just get him in the front seat of my car. Over this side, fella. Get a deal with you by means of a fixed penalty notice, three penalty points on your driving licence, and a £100 fine. I'm also going to give you a ticket tonight for failure to display a tax disc. A tax disc? There's a tax disc in car. There's, there's no tax disc that we're on display. You want to be catching some criminals, man? I am. Eh? I am. I want some proper criminals. All right. So you're not just a... I'll just start doing a few rabbits. You've pulled them up. All right. All right, Philip, there's your further ticket. All right. OK, you're free to go. With no proof of poaching or any evidence the men have been targeting places to burgle, Steve's no choice but to let them continue on to Barnsley. What are they doing? They're going driving two counties away to take home a few rabbits. Well, what's wrong with the rabbits in Barnsley? You know, rabbits are everywhere. It's quite a common thought of mine. Um, what, what did we miss? But at the end of the day, they'll come again. North Yorkshire is largely rural. But, like the rest of the UK, drugs are a major problem. Every community has an issue with drugs. Even Harrogate, which is a really well-off place, uh, we find a lot of cannabis there. Uh, over to Scarborough, where we find quite a bit of Class A drugs. For us, taking out drug dealers is our main priority. At the Force Control Room in York, 
A car linked to a drug dealer who's on the run from prison has hit the police's ANPR cameras. Keep observations out for a Ford Fiesta Zeta guess. 20 miles away, on the A61 near the border with West Yorkshire, road crime team officers James Duffy and Phil Lacey are racing towards the direction of the suspect's car. It's a vehicle linked with uh, drug supply. That's going in towards Harrogate. Proceed, mate, we're just Airwood House now. See if we yeah, can make it. We should be not too far behind the vehicle. So we're just making some progress to see if we can catch up with it. Um, there's information to suggest not only is it linked to drug supply, but it also has links to um, a well-known Harrogate nominal um, that's currently wanted on recall to prison. James's race to catch up with the wanted man is being hampered by traffic. We're going to have to start doing some down here, mate. We'll uh, wait till road clears out and... There. Not any of them. You went through at 23, 23. We would have thought that we'd have um, caught up with it by now if it had come this way. The car they're looking for is nowhere to be seen. At the moment, it's not looking good. Problem is, there's a roundabout just here. Could have gone in one of three ways. But just when their hopes of catching the wanted man disappear, another unit has spotted the suspect's vehicle. It's one of the things I love about policing, that it's so unpredictable. Yeah, let's do it, Phil. And you should never give up, because things can change in an instant. Where are you at the moment? Straight ahead of the lights, uh, Crescent Road. Crescent, Crescent Road? Road. Yeah, go that way. We're very close to it. Go left it. The car's been spotted entering a nearby car park, and James and Phil are on its tail. We cut across the car park with a view to come in the other side of it. As it was, we could see that it went nose in, so the chances of it driving off are relatively slim. Single stop, stand Two. They've found the car. No one, there's two detained. With... But the driver doesn't fit the description of the wanted man. Two. Keep him in if you want, and I'll do checks. I'll get a sheet and we'll go what? through checks if you want. What's your What? Neil Watt. Although the cops haven't caught the wanted man, James smells something suspicious. Straight away, you can smell that it. it smells really strongly of cannabis. Um, so do some checks and then we'll get them searched and see what we come up with. The cops begin a search of the car. The, the amount of stops that we do, the majority of them don't turn anything up. But you have to keep doing it until, um, until you get a result. Um, the more we do, the more we find. A search inside the car proves fruitless. It smells strong, doesn't it? Yeah. Put the bonnet. Have you got the key? But once again, James is determined not to give up. I'd start to question whether they've perhaps brought something back from Leeds and they've actually got it to an address, which is obviously frustrating for us. Um, but we'll wait and see. It just smells that strong that, and the doors are still open and it's still wafting out, which would suggest either there's been a large quantity or there's still some in here. Or it might just be me going mad. Oh, there we go. Got some under here. Uh, obviously, you've got a bag there. That's probably an ounce of cannabis. Uh, more than personal use, I'd say. Can you have just a word with them lads and see what they've got in the way of cash, phones and stuff? In 2014, cannabis possession accounted for nearly three quarters of all drug offences. Finding this amount of drugs might indicate the suspects are dealing. The cops are becoming increasingly curious about what other evidence they may come across. Well, obviously, there's only... Um two people in the uh, in the car and we've got four phones we've got two iPhones and two sort of cheap Samsung phones um, can't imagine why two young lads need four phones between them a number of mobile phones as well that's always a giveaway that they're dealing you'll tend to find that people have their normal iPhone that they use for family friends um, and what we all use phones for but then they'll have some cheap throwaway mobile phones that are on a pay-and-go sim card um, good little find that if you think uh, the amount of budge you've got in there, perhaps uh, one or a couple of them you're looking at a £20 bag. In fact, they're quite big, so I'd say you're looking at probably 150, 200 quid's worth of cannabis there. In this case, they're going to be arrested for possession, or they have been arrested for possession with intent to supply. 
convince the lads are dealers rather than users. For now, the search for the wanted man will have to wait. We don't need to be searching in the dark in the back of Asda car park. We can lock that car down, we can take the lads to custody and then we can look at introducing drugs dogs and doing a more thorough search under better conditions. As a, as a causation, uh, whether that be driver error of some description or a mechanical defect with the vehicle. Um, so it's important when we get to a scene to liaise with those local officers to find out who's involved, what's involved and get an initial assessment of what's gone on. It's now up to Dan to take charge of the scene. There's been a major collision between a VW Passat and a Ford Cougar. Local units made the initial response and now bring Dan and his colleagues up to speed. That's the driver of vehicle number two, the husband right. over there. Um, as I said, I've not spoken to him about it yet. The Cougar vehicle here, they can be spoken to now and they, they right. live local at Slingsby. Have any of them been bagged? Uh, yes, yes both. being breathalysed, right. 
I've recorded number and who's done it, both flew negative. Right. I think in this instance, the vehicles have not only collided at the centre of the crossroads, but uh, as they've spun about, they've collided with each other a second time prior to them uh, coming to rest. The Passat's been travelling out of this road here with the intention of going straight across to where the police cars yeah. are. The Cougar, which is the vehicle that's on its side, has been coming up from this long straight. Um, obviously, the Passat's pulled out with the intention of going straight across into the path of the Cougar. You can see from the damage that they've obviously hit with the front offside corner of the Cougar into the front near side of the um, Passat, which has then spun it and caused the damage to the back end where it's bounced off the car before the Cougar's obviously gone off the road and tumbled onto its side. With one casualty from the red Passat in need of medical attention, the cops talked to the driver, a holidaymaker from Scotland. It's like something had dropped out of the sky on you. Blackness, noise. Yeah disorientation, you come to a stop and hissing noises and you wonder if your wife's all right beside you and you wonder what on earth has happened and then you realise that there was another vehicle there that you hadn't seen and how on earth did you not see it at such a wide open crossroads? Dan thinks he may have the answer to why the Passat driver didn't see the Cougar. Accidents like this one are often caused by day trippers caught out by the unfamiliar terrain. There are some quite substantial dips within that road surface. Up into the distance, the road does drop away, and, and that's the sort of area that can mask a vehicle. And if you just happen to be looking up that, that way, um, whilst the vehicle's in that dip, it can look like a long, straight, clear piece of road. The vehicle could emerge from that dip at 60 miles an hour and, uh, and be on you within seconds, really. With the possibility of a much worse outcome, Dan decides to charge the Passat driver with driving without due care and attention. The driver of the, the Volkswagen Passat has just uh, failed to give way at the, um, the junction, whether that's because they've not seen the junction markings or whether that's because they've thought it was clear and thought they could get across. But ultimately, the buck's got to stop with them, really, because they've put themselves out into, into the, uh, the path of that, uh, that black Ford. For the owners of the Cougar, a local couple, the accidents come as a major scare. Luckily, my first thought was like, Martin, you're all right, you're all right. And he was concerned about me. But um, yes, luckily, some people were on the scene very, very, very quickly, and they all helped us, and they managed to open the driver's door, and we could climb out through there. But it was terrifying, very, very, very scary. I couldn't see out the windscreen at all. The airbags had gone off. Um, really, the first I started to think, I was suspended by my seat belt. Um, it's my, I, my seat ended up at the top, and I was worried about my partner, Mandy, because at that stage, I just didn't know which side of the car had been hit. Mm. and I thought it was Mandy's side that had been here. The holidaymaker's wife, although in need of hospital treatment for some broken bones, has also had a very lucky escape. This chap that was driving the vehicle, he had his wife next to him. Uh, we can see that the, the passenger side door is, is probably one of the only pieces of that vehicle that's undamaged. Um, had the impact been a moment later, then that would, have, that would have taken the full force of the impact and, and the, the lady would have suffered some substantial injuries. Um, and this is something we take into consideration when we decided how to deal with, how to deal with the, the drivers from these accidents. Um, because the, the psychological effects of what's happened will no doubt make them a better and safer driver in future, regardless as to what police action we take. Running through the heart of the North Yorkshire countryside is one of the busiest arterial routes in the UK, the A1. North Yorkshire's 40-mile stretch carries nearly 80,000 cars a day. Any accidents here quickly become a major issue. Incidents that happen on it can cause major, major blockages and, and incidents can become uh, major incidents in a very short space of time. It's 4 p.m and traffic officer Ian Atkinson has just come on shift with trainee Becky Lund to the report of a truck on fire near a busy motorway junction on the A1. 
However, the complicating factor is that it may have uh, hazardous chemicals on board. Now that can mean anything uh, from foodstuffs right up to the two explosives and they mention it's on fire is going to be a major incident. Some of the stuff that's carried on roads these days is lethal and the gas or the fumes can kill you. As Ian arrives, the lorry is already surrounded by the emergency services. Hello, what is it? Do we know? Its trailer is carrying huge bags of trilead dioxide phosphonate used in the production of PVC. It's lead-based, highly toxic, and on fire. I'm not going to repeat it, but it is hazardous. Try, try oxide or something. All right. The fire service have been attending for half an hour, but they've been unable to put out the fire, which is smouldering deep within the bags of chemicals. Yeah, it's gradually escalating the, the seriousness of it. The burning chemicals are releasing toxic fumes dangerously close to a local village. I think we're OK here at the moment. If there's a change in the wind, you may see us shouting and running. I mean, obviously, now they've all got breathing apparatus on. So the powers that be have declared it a critical incident. So, yeah, we've got a major incident on our hands now. As the fire service fight the burning chemicals, Ian's main priority now is to find out how the incident was caused. The only way we can find that out is to speak to the driver, um, which is what I was given the task of doing, and to, uh, to get his account of, of what had happened. Have a chat with you up here. If there are any offences involved, he may have done something that he, he, he may need arresting. What, what is it that's on board? Uh, oh, you don't speak English? Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah, Where are you from? Polish. You're Polish? Yeah. You understand English at all? <laughs> Little. Who, who do you work for? Who are you driving for? It's that international language, isn't it? You start using your hands and talk a bit slower and shout at them. Driving licence? Where have you come from today? Scunthorpe. Where were you going to? Newcastle. With the language barrier, Ian's finding it difficult to establish the cause of the fire and whether any traffic offences have been committed. Do we know what set it off yet? Right. I can't ascertain why there's a load in the back on fire, there's no damage to the truck. Right. When was his last stop? He hadn't stopped another stop. I can't get that out of him. The fire service are still unable to put the fire out, and the traffic cops need to minimise any hazard to road users. The roads adjoining the A1 are being closed. we shut the 168. Yeah, that one's Both shut. North and south. Um, the on-slip will need shutting. That's the truck. The biggest decision is whether or not to close the motorway. Do we keep the road open? Do we shut the road? Hundreds of thousands of vehicles use that road every, every day. It's one of the main routes from the north uh, in Scotland down to, uh, down to London. With the fire still burning, more crews arrive to tackle it. But the chief fire officer has declared the risk too great and asked Ian to close the motorway. Because there is an explosive risk with it. So it's just southbound at the moment that we're shutting. Yeah. As soon as that's shut, we've got 168 shut, so we should be sterile and they'll be able to do what they need to do. Yeah. Motorway closures cost the economy £1 billion every year. And with the southbound A1 shut, thousands of motorists are going nowhere. You may have people who have no idea what's happening. All they can see is emergency vehicles ahead. As soon as you start closing lanes, and causing obstructions on it, you, uh, you it'll ground to a halt and, and, the, and it just becomes a car park. 25 miles away on the outskirts of York, traffic cop Martin Hayes is attending a report of another accident involving a local man who's been caught out by worsening weather conditions. I've got the RTC. It's like it's damage only. Part of the car into a hedge at neighbouring lane. Get the down there. It can do. Martin needs to investigate what's taken place. It's quite a narrow country road, so I'll make my way and see um, see what's happened. Make sure there's been uh, either no uh, drinking, drug use, or uh, an illness at the wheel. It could just be 
for want of a better description, they may have got to the corner and run out of talent. There's always a reason for an accident to happen. Uh, it's rare that you have an accident that is, by its very de definition, an accident. So much so that years ago, we stopped referring to, to them as accidents that became collisions. I'm guessing nine, 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 it'll be this car in this hedge. My first impression was, how's he managed that? Because at the point where he's left the road there, the nearest corner's probably, I think it was the best part of a quarter of a mile down the road. The driver's brother and nephew are already on the scene trying to free the car from the hedge. Hello. Who was driving at the time? Was it yourself? Yeah. You'd be stuck on a tree stump underneath. What's happened then? Oh, I've gone too fast, mate. I must have agreed. Right. Um, what sort of speed were we doing? I don't know. I don't right. know, to be honest. I don't know. His first words to me when uh, I've asked him what's happened was, it, was that he was going too fast. I've heard all manner of excuses, wildlife jumping out at them. It was quite refreshing to have somebody straight away admit their fault in an accident. I'm a, I'm a farmer just outside Nairburn. I was just I was on my way to Morrison's for some, some beer so I could sit and watch the rugby. Right. Well, hopefully we'll get you out of here before the match finishes. <laughs> he probably travels that road on an almost daily basis. People become over familiar with the route and complacency sets in. Unable to free Graham's car from the scrub, his brother and nephew leave to get more equipment from their nearby farm. They're determined to get the car out themselves. It's up to them how they have the car recovered. Although I can have it recovered for them at their expense, there's no need to do that because where it sits, it doesn't present a danger to other road users. While the farmer may know his local area inside out, Graham is still getting to know his car, which is a recent new purchase. I've only had the car a week. I've been looking on the website for about a year until the right one came along. Then I've gone and peeped it on time. Yeah, I know the road really well. I should know better. I mean, the weather's diabolical today. It's blowing a holy and um, I'm looking at all sorts of excuses, but there's only one excuse and I was going too fast. Whenever you get a new car, the performance will be different, the handling characteristics will be different, and until you've learnt what the car will do under certain circumstances, you're never going to know how it will react. It's looking like a fairly straightforward, too fast for the conditions. It's a straight road with a very... You know, there's nothing of a bend on it, so there's no reason for it to have happened. I mean, the gent says himself straight away, I was going too fast, so... As Martin decides what course of action to take against the driver, the sun is setting, and tonight a severe storm is forecast. It's bad news for the rescue services on the A1. The fire has been burning for over two hours and the motorway is still closed. The storm could make their job even more difficult. The conditions are gradually changing. The darkness has come down now, so uh, the visibility we're losing. Temperatures dropping as well. I mean, obviously, there's officers in the near, nearby village um, advising people to stay in the house because, obviously, the wind has moved round slightly and it's now heading northeasterly instead of uh, east as it was. For traffic cop Ian, the priority now is to establish whether the Polish lorry driver has committed any offences. We're going, we're going to get an interpreter yeah. on the phone yeah. and try and just have a conversation with you. Sheltering from the weather in the patrol car, Ian and the fire chief interview the driver via an interpreter. If you can ask uh, Jacek what uh, actually happened and how he came to realise that something was wrong. I was driving and I noticed a little smoke in the back under the tarpaulin. So I looked inside and I noticed that there is a smoke inside, but because there were chemicals, I didn't want to look closer or breathe it. I was afraid of, um, for my own security, I didn't want to breathe that. There's always a chance that proceedings will be taken against the company or the driver. There could be various things, um, depending on how the load had been put together. If it had been loaded wrong, there's, there's issues there. When, when, the, uh, when, the, when the product was loaded on, do you know if it had come directly from a production line, could it still have been warm? I was told that the load is not ready yet, so I have to wait outside um, 
the house and uh, wait for the load, for them to pick up the load. So I was waiting about 40 minutes outside. Then they called me and I saw the person bringing the load. OK, I think uh, that's lovely. Thanks. Thanks very much for your help. Bye-bye now. With his interview complete, it becomes clear the driver is in no way to blame. In fact, his quick thinking is likely to have prevented a far worse outcome. The risk of explosion is still high, and Inspector McBarron of the Major Collision Investigation Team is on scene, overseeing the operation. Well, we've got recovery, a specialist recovery team um, organised by the owners of the vehicle. They're coming from Darlington, uh, which is about 45 minutes away. But the problem that we're going to have is that they've got to get through the two-mile tailbacks that we've got on the road. So hopefully they'll be able to come, take the contaminated stuff and the good stuff, and then we can get the trailer removed, and then everyone can go home. And it's snowing sideways, and it's cold. The weather isn't just a problem for the firefighters on the A1. With gales of 80 miles an hour, Storms like these can shut down communities across rural North Yorkshire. It's up to the traffic cops to keep the roads open. At the force control room in York, it's 8 p.m. and operators are being kept busy with reports of a serious disruption to the country roads. The reports are coming in thick and fast everywhere. With our control room, they can tell us where the obstructions are. And it's their job to kind of prioritize that. And without their overview, we'd be blind, really. 15 miles away, on the southern borders of the county near Selby, James Duffy and Mick Roth are back on night patrol. Yes, you can do. I'm getting two or three jobs coming in down for uh, S Creek, Stilling Sweet Road, Mill Hill, etc. Yeah, we can have a look for you. We're just round the corner. Is it just a tree down in the road, or...? Yes, yes. As the calls mount up and the weather worsens, Mick's getting nervous. And you just get the feeling that it's going to be one hell of a night. The road to the left. There's three trees down there, you can't get that way either. Alright, we're going to have a look. Cheers, thank you. That's how I feel, mate. That's a big tree there. Yeah. There's another tree you can walk down. It's not a right lot we can do with that, James, is it? Mick and James find a mature tree stretched right across the carriageway. You'll grab that end. Alright, yeah. I'll grab it. 9 1, there's absolutely nothing we can do with this one. The road's totally blocked. There's another three trees down in this location as well, further along apparently. Most things we go to, we know how to deal with it or we can deal with it without needing anyone else, but you get to that and you sort of go, what now? With roads closed and no backup available, the cops are approached by a local farmer offering to help them clear the way. I remember the public approached us uh, and said he had some farm machinery nearby. Are you, are you taking him, Jim? Yeah, I'll take him down. We kind of, you know, said, would you please help, help us clear some trees off the roads? And the tractor driver's straight on the job, clearing the road as he goes. This guy, a real good Samaritan, real good egg, came out and just started throwing these trees around all over the place. Run, Dom! <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh! In fact, he's so quick, the cops have to run to keep up. The power in the machine is unbelievable to us.
third parts of the load and the fire sort of got deep seated into the uh, into the chemical now and uh, now what we're waiting for is a recovery company coming onto the scene who have got some specialist equipment which we can then transfer the product from the trailer into a, a secure container. This is the rest of the uh, specialist recovery coming down into the escort now. The fire service have advised everybody to go to the other side of the scene, at least 100 metres away, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be safe there. The operation begins by removing the undamaged part of the load. It wasn't going to be quick. They're unloading it, and the, the, some of the, the chemicals falling onto the road, which obviously that's going to need seeing too. So it was a long, long process. What's left are six pallets of smouldering chemicals. As long as we could keep it from blowing in the atmosphere, it would be uh, it would be relatively safe. The crew attempt to move the most unstable bags of burning chemicals, but the wind blows toxic ash all over the road. It was a mess. Had the wind got any stronger or changed direction, then we definitely would have been looking at getting people in the houses or maybe even evacuating them to somewhere else. All this will have to be cleaned up before the motorway reopens. I mean, any incident that, that shuts the, the A1 and the, and, and the motorway is a massive job. Um, causes an awful lot of disruption to an awful lot of people. The motorway closure is a small price to pay. The chief fire officer believes if the lorry had reached its next destination, a ferry terminal, the incident could have become a disaster. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse if the lorry had made its way to the docks and, and got on the ferry to Italy, which is the destination where it was going. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. Seven and a half hours since the emergency services first arrived, Ian finally hears the words he and thousands of frustrated motorists have been waiting for. Yeah, it's, it's safe to go up now. Spot on, yeah, mate. We've just got to move the trailer, sweep under the trailer and all that road area is clear, sort of thing. Right, excellent. Thanks, fellas. Ian's job right. is done and the police open the A1 motorway. But elsewhere, the weather conditions are still causing chaos on rural roads. Facing a growing number of fallen trees, Mick and James look again to the farmer and his forklift for assistance. If you want to back right up, yeah. I'll just bring it so I think it'll be all right for tonight. Yeah, look at me. Are you all right trying to do a couple of others? Without this guy turning up and offering his help, we'd have still been sat on that first tree with the blue lights flashing and ultimately we'd have had to probably shut roads all around the area. I'm not happy being around all these trees, are you? I can recall looking up at the trees and they're all creaking and you think, well, if one of them comes down, we don't stand a chance. He's all right in the arm and things that he's got, isn't he? Look at the camel. He's cleared it onwards. <laughs> with yet another tree blocking the road, the farmer and his forklift continue to clear away for the cops. In he comes with his big uh, heavy-duty forklift and, and away the tree goes again. This guy was cutting through trees like a, a knife through butter. He cleared the roads and made our job really, really easy. Great thanks to him for doing that. Just start clearing this stuff up. Yet again, the rural landscape of North Yorkshire requires a varied job description. Most of us join, really, to, to catch baddies and uh, lock up those people that make other people's lives a misery, but uh, I think everybody who joins has got it in their nature that they want to help people, they want to help out, and this is sort of real basic grassroots level of uh, what have we got? We've got a rubbish night, we've got trees down everywhere, we've got bobbies run ragged, um, and all we're trying to do is keep people safe. Making him an honorary bobby and give him a blue light. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. driving around with that with blue light flashing. He's the tree destroyer, <laughs> isn't he? No action was taken against the speeding driver who lost control on a bridge and plunged 30 feet into a river. 
The driver of the red Audi A4, who'd been out catching rabbits with his friends, was given a £100 ticket and three points for his bald tyres. The driver caught with the cannabis by James and Phil pleaded guilty to drug dealing and he received a supervision order and 180 hours unpaid work. The cannabis the police found had an estimated value of £700. The tourist who crashed into the local couple on a rural crossroads was reported for careless driving and completed a driver improvement scheme. Although the fire service believe a foreign object heating the chemicals during the loading process was likely to be the cause of the fire, it could not be proved and they regarded it as an accident. No action was taken against the HGV driver or his company. And the speeding farmer who lost control of his new car on his way home completed a driver improvement course.